making and installing keyhole escutcheons. For DVDs, drawings, tools, and project articles, please visit my website, AmericanFederalPeriod.com. I'm going to switch hats here for a minute and do some metal working. When it comes to the keyhole escutcheons, it's always a compromise, it seems like. You have the factory ones that are very uniform in size and shape, quite unlike the originals. And then if you buy the reproduction ones from like Londonderry Brass or um, a Whitechapel or Optima Brass, they are uh, beautifully made, but they're often far bigger than you need. But they do display a certain individuality. But then, because they're cast from an original, yes, they aren't perfectly symmetrical, but they're all exactly alike. And when you look at uh, genuine period pieces, the keyhole discussions vary a little bit. Then when you add to that, that I often have to modify the factory ones to fit the keys, or I can't find one that's the right size, and I'll talk more about that in a second. And I always take and file the sides of the discussion so that it has a slightly like wedge shape to aid in the inlining. If I'm gonna stand around and do all that, I might as well make my own. But the real clincher is finding the ones that are the right size. Very often you can find one that has the proper hole diameter for the barrel of the key, but the part that actually activates the lock, it's usually far bigger than it needs to be. And then you see some of the lock from inside the thing, or inside the keyhole, or a lot of times I will take an inlet, a piece of black dyed veneer and to hide that, and then just have the opening be just the size it needs for the key to go through. It's an awful lot of extra work, and it doesn't take that long to make them, because brass uh, machines beautifully with uh, normal woodworking tools. So let's go and see how we make those keyhole discussions. You really can't show the layout on camera. The pieces are just too small, and uh, your fingers get in the way, the scriber gets in the way, everything like that. So I'm going to describe what tools I use and give an overview of the process and then show you the completed layout. I have here the piece of brass that's going to be the keyhole discussions. It's an eighth inch thick, inch and a half wide. And I bought this from a metal supplier specifically for making hardware. But at estate sales and flea markets, you often see old brass butt hinges. And I'll buy those from time to time. And because usually the hardware parts that you make are small, they can be made out of those and go around the screw holes that are in them. But take a magnet with you because uh, the brass plating can be very effective and you can come home with what you thought were brass hinges only to find out they're brass plated steel. And then to darken the material so that you can see what you're doing, I used to use layout fluid but now I just use a wide magic marker for that. works really well. And I'm going to measure the keyhole or the keys uh, barrel and I'm going to do that with a micrometer. I know that's a bit of overkill, but I did it and it measures 200 thousandths of an inch in diameter. And my original thought was to have a, a hole 1 16th of an inch bigger than that, giving a 1 32nd clearance all around. But when I did a preliminary layout, I found out that that was too large. So I'm going to drop that down to 1 32nd bigger or 1 64th of an inch clearance around the barrel of the key. And looking at this decimal equivalent chart here, if I take 200 thousandths and add a 32nd to it, that comes up to like 231 thousandths. And the closest fractional equivalent to that is 1564. So with that, I can use this circle template, which goes down to 64 to uh, scribe onto the steel with the, or onto the brass. I mean, with this scriber. And then I've got the other sundry layout tools, you know, a ruler, square, a sliding key bevel to give the tapered shape to the keyhole discussion. And something that you don't see very often in woodworking, and I don't know why, even though we are working with metal here, it's a hermaphrodite caliper. It's a, got a small hook, almost like what you would see on an outside caliper. And then one leg is a scriber, and you can use that to scribe lines parallel to the edge. And why these aren't more common in woodworking, I don't know, because I found quite a few uses for them. This is a really small pair of Lufkins that were in like almost mint, unused condition. And for $2, I picked up this nice pair of Sterrets recently, but they need a bit of cleaning and a lot, a lot of sharpening. They're pretty dull, but they're really, really nice tools. 
So now we can go on to the uh, actual layout process. Well, no, actually I'm going to make one right now and uh, complete it and then see how I like it because they have to be done with quite a bit of precision and a lot of symmetry or they'll look funny. So you have to really work to a fairly tight tolerance and a small change can make a, a pretty significant impact in the final appearance. So I'm going to make one to make sure I like it before I make all that I need for the table. It was impossible to film that because I kept getting my hands in the way so I just decided to go ahead and lay it out and show you how I laid it out. And here is the key superimposed over it and you can see that they're a, a nice uh, match to one another. Not too big and not too small. Gives plenty of clearance. So what I have is a uh, 15 64th inner hole. Down here is a 1 8 inch hole to make the bottom and then around the outside is an 11 32nd inch diameter to establish the outside perimeter of it and I forget what the that one was let me see that was uh, one quarter inch diameter for the bottom and then I of course I have a, a center line scribed on there and then with the sliding T bevel set at an angle that I just eyeballed I've made the uh, allowances for the sides. And I got this one off a little. If I look at that very carefully, I see that this leg is right. This leg over here is a little bit too narrow. So I'll just scribe that in a little bit better. And now I can take the dividers and set those up so that they are on the two center lines of the holes that I'm going to drill and then I can go and scribe those lines that distance apart and drill a series of holes and then connect the dots so to speak. But we're going to make this one first just to make sure then I'll show you how you lay them out in multiples on the piece of brass. This is why I go ahead and made the test one because I don't like the way this turned out at all. Looks like the center to a skull and crossbones don't have nearly enough flare here on the uh, bottom. So I'm going to make an adjustment and then go ahead and make the rest of them. Here is a drawing of the as-built keyhole discussion and kudos to our art department. They are simply the best in the business. Look at this graphic here. So we have a 11 seconds outside diameter, a 15 64th hole, a 5 30 seconds hole, 7 64th outside diameter. Those uh, holes are on 9 30 seconds of an inch center and the flare to the uh, keyhole discussion is 17 degrees. I said I wasn't going to show the layout but I do want to show this part because it's kind of uh, crucial and it's not much is in the way here. I've got the uh, center lines scribed on here to make five discussions. I have one that turned out right and I need four for the uh, table. Then I'm making two for a friend so I need a total of six so that's why I have five here and they're spaced 7 sixteenths of an inch apart and that gives me enough room to comfortably saw them out because you can't really saw them out right on the line you have to saw somewhat close to the line and finish it by filing and we'll see that and then these two horizontal lines represent the uh, center lines of the hole one for the barrel of the key and the other for the actuator part of the key and I scribe those with a hermaphrodite caliper and I'll show you how I, how that works and this is such a neat little tool that I've really not paid much attention to I've seen them for years in catalogs and stuff but really never used one and describes a really nice line accurately from the edge now this is a firm joint one so it relies on the tension to hold it its setting and you might have to play with it a little bit to get it so that it's easy to adjust but not so easy to knock out of alignment and then with those center lines scribed I can take and center punch them so that the drill won't wander around and what I like to do is place the center punch on there at an angle like that then rotate it up because that allows me to see what I need and then strike it and this is kind of a small one and it would probably work but I'll go back and deepen it with a little bit larger diameter one but I find that the larger diameter one 
doesn't allow me to position it with as much accuracy as I need for this project. I've done a pretty careful setup here at the drill press to ensure success. Now it's going to seem like a lot of work to drill these holes, but uh, they need to be in very close tolerances in relation to each other so that you get uh, a properly symmetrical keyhole discussion. And in order to do that, you have to uh, take, take a bit of time with the layout and the setup and the drilling. And brass is a very grabby material. And you would not want to do this freehand because you could easily get injured with it. And even here in the vise, I would be hesitant to drill these holes in one shot. I think I could drill this 964 hole that's going to be of the eventual size here in one shot. But I'm going to go ahead and drill it in two. It was pretty much... Uh, imperative to drill a two-step a two-stage hole for these ones up here because these are 1564 and I worked uh, part-time in a machine shop for eight years drilling deep holes in copper and that taught me a lot about drill bit geometry and lubrication now if you were drilling a lot of brass you would probably want to take and modify the drill bits to have a negative rake which would really cut down on that grabbiness but that's a ridiculous extreme to go to to make a few keyhole discussions. So I'm just going to use the standard drill bit. But I am going to lubricate it. Now you could easily uh, drill brass dry, but I think the lubrication helps control some of that grabbiness. It also uh, is easier on your drill bits, I think, makes them last longer. And normally I would use kerosene for this, but I hate the smell of kerosene and I didn't really have any. And I found that the dark thread cutting oil from Odie that I use for like pipe threading is listed as being suitable for brass and sure enough it works quite well. You could also use Crisco uh, in the machine shop they did that quite often when drilling non-ferrous metals and I'm kind of paranoid about introducing oils into my woodworking environment so I'm going to be very careful with this and even then when I'm done I'm going to clean it up with paint thinner because the last thing I want to do is start getting oil on my wood and not have the finish take like it should and uh, so I think it it would be best probably to drill the hole and then change out the drill bits and enlarge it all at the same setting but that's a kind of a ridiculous extreme to go to also so with that center line here on the vise that I have scribed and index that with the center line on the layout on the material I can get an accurate enough uh, interface between those two holes. So I'm going to drill the set of holes at the 364 and then change out bits and then come back and enlarge them. And like I said, I know this seems like a kind of a lot of work to go through, but if you want them to turn out right, it's worth it to spend a few minutes and uh, drill them in these stages like this. You notice that I used a, a brush to brush away the chips. You wouldn't want to reach in there with your fingers or any kind of a rag and have a potential of getting it caught up in the drill bit. So always have a chip brush handy to safely clean up the chips. Now I'm going to go back and enlarge them with the 532nd drill bit. I think I earlier misspoke and said it was 964, but it's actually 532nd drill bit. See what I mean about being grabby? Now I know that that's not much of an enlargement, but it kind of pulled the work, pulled the bit into the work. And that's why it needs to be well secured and well indexed on that mark. Because if it pulls it in too much, it could either break the drill bit or make the hole, uh, distort the hole and then ruin the piece because you need uh, a pretty accurately sized hole for this. The 
the holes are complete and the layout now is also complete and I'm happy with the way the holes turned out even this one right here that the drill bit pulled the work out of the vise I think you might be able to see that there's very slightly uh, distorted right here but that's luckily not in an area that it won't matter because that's going to get sawn away and then I used the circle template to uh, scribe this 11 32nd diameter circle up here and that one looks like it could be a little bit more symmetrical but I can take care of that in the filing stages and then down here was a 17 64 inch uh, diameter circle there and then with the sliding t-bevel scribed in these angled lines to uh, represent the flared part of the keyhole and so now they can be sawn at the scroll saw. I've moved over to the scroll saw and I've installed a blade in here that's not specifically made for cutting metal but I think it'll be a good one. It has 28 teeth per inch and it's 22 thousandths of an inch wide. I would have liked to have something a little bit coarser than that but uh, I think this this will do okay and like with the uh, drilling I've applied a tiny bit of oil to the blade just to help lubricate it. I'm not so sure if that's a good thing or not. It does seem like the blades last longer when I lubricate them, but the blower for the scroll saw does not have enough oomph to move the brass chips anyways, and then when you introduce oil, they really cling to it. But uh, it'll work well enough. I don't have to saw right on the line because there's going to be some filing necessary. I just want to get it to get that waste out of there so I can get a file in to work on it and I've got the speed set at its lowest setting to try it out at first and I might be able to go up from there we'll see after the first test cut but you certainly don't want to start out too high because uh, the blades will uh, kind of glaze instead of cut and then it dulls them really quickly Yeah, I think I can go up a little bit there. Well, that cut well enough, but it was quite difficult to keep it on the line. I don't know if you noticed how much I had to uh, turn that piece of work to keep it cutting straight. This blade has a considerable amount of drift to it. I don't know if that's this blade, because I bought a, uh, a, a package of blades at Lowe's from Bosch. Not something I normally buy, so I don't know if that's just typical of these blades, or if this is really not the best blade for cutting brass. I'm going to try something different here and see uh, if I can do a little bit better work than that. I've installed another blade in the scroll saw here. Uh, I thought that that one was a little bit on the fine side, and I think it was, and then it wasn't actually meant for metalworking. I used to have some blades that were meant for metalworking that were on the order of that type of uh, tooth configuration, but this wasn't a high-quality blade, so I probably should have known better. But I went in and looked in my rather eclectic collection of uh, scroll saw blades, very few of them which are labeled, and I found one that seemed appropriate. It's quite a bit coarser, and I'll, I'll measure the width and get an idea of what I think the uh, teeth per inch are, but it was a pinned end blade, so I had to beat the pins out of it to get it to fit in this machine, and I'm going to put it in here. I think another problem was I didn't have the tension up quite high enough, so I'm gonna really crank the tension up on this one. Of course, I have to strike a balance there that I don't uh, put so much tension on it that it breaks or pulls loose from the, the chuck. And again, I'm going to take and turn the speed down at first and see how things are cutting. Yeah, I can go up from there too. My saw has a sweet spot of uh, speeds. There's a, a range there where no matter what I'm cutting, even thin wood, it tends to vibrate. So I've got to watch that I don't go in that range. 
Yeah, that's much better. I had already saw on the one side, so uh, I can go on. I'm not trying to saw right to the line. I just don't like how much lead that one blade had. It was very hard to control. I just need to get the waste cleared out of there enough that I can maybe get a file in there. That one's, that last one I just did is kind of on the thin side. I'm going to do a little bit better job, but I'll move on and do the other three here. That blade was 20 thousandths of an inch thick. 108 thousandths of an inch wide and about 15 teeth per inch. I'm at the auxiliary bench which has a machinist type vise mounted in it and it's got a jaws that are serrated so they'll uh, uh, you know disfigure the material so to keep that from happening I've taken a block of wood and with some rare earth magnets uh, mounted in it use that as a uh, clamping jaw there to eliminate the marring of the material and I had hoped to saw close enough to the line to allow me to insert the file of choice for this job and that is this little uh, mini file here from of all people S and K. Uh, you know you think of them more as sockets but at one point they made files and I probably had this file set close to 20 years now. It comes with a two flat files around and a triangular file and I kind of guard these with my life because it's getting harder and harder to find good quality files but this one won't quite fit in from the beginning so I had to open it up with another file and that is this which is a Swiss Grobe half round file now these are still high quality files when you can find them but this set that I got this out of was not a set I had a whole box of these that were uh, dated in September of 1977 my dad got them as a sample back in the 70s and uh, I'll use that to open up enough to let the uh, other file in. And I want to be very careful that I don't nick my top and bottom radiuses with this file. So I want to go fairly carefully. And also, I like to pick up on the return stroke when using a file. That makes it last longer, I think. Let's see if that's enough to get this file in. Yeah, that's enough to get this bigger file in. And this one cuts quite a bit faster. And I'm not con terribly concerned about the surface quality on the, on the inside of this keyhole discussion. But this uh, file has one drawback to it, that the edges aren't safe. That is, they're not ground smooth. They have teeth on them. So I'm going to have to be uh, conscious that I don't, again, nick the radius parts of the keyhole which I want to keep uh, pristine and that's a little bit more difficult because this file is almost the same width as the uh, keyhole is high and I'm looking at the scribe line and the scribe lines a guide but not the last word because what I want to have happen is the flared part I want that to flow perfectly in to the radius part of this lower one that was drilled and I don't want any steps in there, so the scribe line will get me close, but uh, my eyesight's going to have to be the last word. And that looks really good there. And now I'll just keep moving on and doing all of these and then flip it over and go in the other direction so I'm always working down where I can see the best and work the best and then we can go on to cutting them apart and filing out the perimeter shapes. At the bandsaw I'm going to uh, saw the individual escutcheons off of this blank and I've scribed a line here with the hermaphrodite caliper that I'm going to cut to so that I'll be left with a parallel sided piece for future projects that allows it to be clamped in the vise and then I'm just going to cross cut them and I space them out enough that I can cross cut between them without nicking the edges of the layout lines. It would be nice to be able to uh, saw very close to the desired shape but it's really not worth the effort. It's kind of hard to hold these pieces and uh, you don't want your fingers that close to the blade and also 
they're so small that they'll almost go through the, uh, I could put a zero clearance insert in here, but they wouldn't, they could almost go through that. And the brass is so soft that it's not difficult or time consuming to file them to their shape. And I've got the same blade in here that I use for woodworking. It's a Sterrett bimetal blade. It's a variable pitch. I think it's uh, 8 to 12, but don't quote me on that. It's 3 eighths of an inch wide. And of course, being made for metalworking, it cuts this brass beautifully, even at the higher speed that you would have on a woodworking type bandsaw. So I'll go ahead and make those cuts. Now it would have been better for me to saw those off starting at the end one and saw and saw and saw, but there wasn't enough room in the throat of my bandsaw to do that, so it forced me to saw off the blank first and then the individual pieces off, which you did see that got my hands very close to the blade. It also blocked some of the view for you, the viewer, but uh, bandsaw is a safe tool and I don't really have any problems getting my fingers that close to it. I don't know if you can see it or not on the camera, but I've got it clamped with the small end up and the radius is right there. You can see the scribe lines and I've got probably about a little less than a 30 second here at the bottom. What I'm going to do is file essentially 45 degree flats on each side of that and with the, uh, the, the large file and you'll see how quickly this hogs the material off. And that's about as close as I dare go to the layout lines. And then I'm going to rotate it 180 degrees and do the same thing to the large end of the keyhole. And now rotate it 90 degrees, either clockwise or counterclockwise, depending on which edge you want to do. And here I'm looking to create a little bit of a pocket to get the file started in so that I can do the flared part of the keyhole. And that looks like that's good there. But then I can take the course file because I've made a step there now I need to get a 45 going on the underneath side of the large diameter of the keyhole this isn't terribly controllable here that's why I'm leaving a little bit between the line layout lines and my filed area with that large file and now roll it around and do the same thing on the other edge started that step up a little high so let me see if I can 
work by using side pressure this way, work it back. Yeah, there we go. And here, here again, the layout lines are not the end of the story. They should get me very close, but I'm going to file down to them and then take it out and examine it and see where I need to do some work to make sure that it's symmetrical. But now that I'm close to the layout lines, I'm switching over to the uh, six inch grow bay file and this will cut really nice, leave a beautiful finish. Not that the finish matters, but it does cut beautifully. And then the area where I like to make the sharp shoulder with the uh, three-quarter file is right there where the radius comes down and then goes to the flared part. And with some careful positioning of the file, I can make a really nice sharp transition there. And I'll just continue this way around. Uh, and then take it out and examine it and see where it needs refining to look proper. The keyhole on the right has had the layout fluid removed. Uh, in this case, that's magic marker. And the one on the left still retains it. Now, both of these discussions are equally asymmetrical. But uh, the one that's had the layout fluid removed, it's much more obvious. So that's why I do that. And you can see, it's uh, quite easy to see, that... Uh, quite a bit thinner here than it is over here. This looks pretty good around there. Might be a little bit too fat there. I've got some kind of weird flat right there that I need to work on, but it'll only take a few minutes with the finer of the two files to uh, get that looking really good. They have all been filed to shape now, and I am satisfied with the symmetry. They don't look exactly alike, but that wasn't the goal. But in and of themselves, the individuals look good symmetrically and have a pleasing shape. Now the next step is to prepare them for inletting. Up until this point I have tried to keep the edges that I was filing square but now I want to file a very shallow angle on them making the front wider than the back so that there's kind of a wedging action as the piece is driven into its mortise and it's very slight and you can see kind of the angle I'm looking for here this would be level so I'm just raising it up very slightly and when I'm making this cut I'm looking at the texture of the uh, edge and I can see a faint line where I am removing metal and I just take that back till it just barely reaches the uh, square edge of the face and I'll do that it's quite easy here on the uh, flat side where the flare is it gets a little more challenging here on the uh, rounded parts but it can be done and it doesn't have to be done perfect just to, enough to help uh, secure a good fit when you go to inlay it and so that I can tell them apart I have blackened the back face with the magic marker and left the front face polished that way it's immediately apparent what goes where and I'll just continue around the perimeter filing these and then we can move on to the actual inlaying process. I've got the drawer uh, pretty much clamped in the same kind of system that I had when I planed the sides. That is, I got a board cantilevered off the edge of the bench, padded with this piece of cloth. And in this case, I've got the lock in place, and I've got it clamped down here with this clamp because I don't want anything to move while I'm doing this next step because it's critical that I don't uh, have anything to concentrate on but holding the escutcheon in place. And one of the downsides of making your own escutcheon is that you really have to do a great job inletting it because I've kind of fit this with the minimum of clearance around it. So if I don't get it exactly over the center of that post on the lock, it's just not going to work and then I'm going to have to file on it to get it to work and I want to avoid that at all costs. I've got a vertical line here so that I don't have the keyhole, you know, I'm exaggerating it, but I don't have it cocked off to one side. And I could not get it to film it because it just couldn't get the light and the camera and everything lined up. But I'm looking down through the hole that I have here and I'm going to center the opening for the barrel of the key on that post 
and then eyeball to make sure it's going vertically and then without moving it and I just moved it a little bit so let me uh, reset that that looks good there now without moving it and I used to use a knife for this but I've started using uh, a sharpened scriber and it does a little bit better job or well I don't know if it does a better job but it's much more controllable a knife wanted to follow the grain and it was hard when he came around the corners not to shoot off and scribe somewhere that you didn't mean to scribe and those kind of uh, cuts across the grain are very hard to disguise and a lot of times I'm doing this into a veneered surface so you don't have the option of sanding it away like a wood here or planing it away and I just want to make sure that I'm, I've gone around enough that I'll be able to see that scribe line when I take the escutcheon out of the way. And it's going to be very faint, but I'll be able to see that. And then I'm going to uh, darken that, or well, deepen it, I guess, is a better way to say it, with the uh, scriber here without the keyhole in the way. And I guess I should have said that I made sure that I had the right side up. I had the shiny brass face up and the darkened side down so that I have that tapered shape there that aids in getting a good fit. And now I'll set up a router to route this material away, getting as close as I can to the line and then cleaning it up with some gouges. I'm going to use the plunge router to uh, make the recess for the keel discussion and that's a little odd choice because this is a very large router for that small task but it's got a couple advantages here uh, first and foremost is I've got excellent visibility through the opening here something I wouldn't get with the uh, laminate trimmer I would get that with the fixed space version of this but the other reason is because this one has this nice adept stop here I can take one of the keyhole escutcheons or a piece of the scrap brass that it was made from and put that there in the turret and uh, set the depth stop so that I can come right out at the right depth. And I actually set it just a little bit over after I got it set with the piece of scrap. I turned the fine adjustment screw up a little bit because I'm not terribly concerned about uh, going too deep. I don't want it to bottom out before it's uh, flush with the surface because then I'd have to file it. And I've got a 1 8 inch carbide end mill in the uh, router here. That gives a, a good balance between uh, removing the material in a timely manner and having a bit that's controllable and uh, not too large. And I've got a uh, aftermarket collet for this router so I can put it right in there instead of having to use one of those sleeve adapter things. It's a lot more convenient and the uh, aftermarket one was very well made and inexpensive. So now I'll just go over here uh, where I've got the drawer and I've got it clamped off to the side. I don't have it clamped real tight because I can't really get a good bite on it, but I just don't want it moving around while I'm doing this because this is going to require total concentration. And you'll have to decide for yourself how close you're willing to come to your layout line when you're doing this. I'm comfortable coming within a 64th or maybe even a little less, but uh, err on the side of caution, of course, and start. I can't film it because it's just too tight start in the center and work your way out. You wouldn't want to start at the edge because if it grabs, it may pull it past your uh, scribe line. After I completed scribing for the keyhole discussion, I taped it to the drawers because the, you know, I don't want to get them, they're not interchangeable. I don't want to get them confused which one went where. And I've also went around and here on the uh, bottom edge of the back of the drawer, I've labeled which one it is because very shortly the uh, chalk labeling that I put on from the beginning is going to be obscured so I want to know what drawer went where. I'd be able to figure it out by the grain pattern but it's a good idea to have it scribed on there somewhere just in case. And I'm going to clamp this down and route that material out. I've got a little bit of extra light here on the subject because I uh, really need to see what's going on here. It's absolutely critical to not route past those lines and then I'll route it and we'll come back with the gouges to uh, clean it up right to the line.
I don't know if you could notice it or not, but there was a lot of hesitation when I went to push that down. And it's just not sliding as well as it should. And I can't have anything that's interfering with uh, the router going exactly where I want it to. So I'm going to take a minute and wax this bottom. Let the wax dry really well and buff it very good. Because again, I don't want to contaminate my woods, raw wood surfaces with anything that could cause a potential down the road for uh, finishing problems. For some reason, when I wax anything else in the shop, I use this Johnson Paste Wax or whatever the cheapest wax I can find is. But when I do my router bases, and sometimes my, I also wax the base on the jigsaw, I use this conservator's wax. And this stuff's expensive. I almost like I had to check my credit rating before I could buy it. But it goes on very thin, dries hard, so it lasts a good while. And I feel like it's less likely to transfer. But even with that in mind, I've already applied the wax to this. I'm going to let it dry for a few minutes, then buff it really, really well before I go back to routing for the uh, keyhole discussion. Well, the wax is dried on the base now, and I buffed it out, and I've tried it out to see if it works, and I'm a lot happier with the way it slides, so I'm going to go ahead and make the cut here. I zoomed in as close as I can and I think you can see how close I, I like to get to the line, the scribe line. It was a little bit uh, farther away down here than what I like and I actually got a little bit closer here than I would like because I really couldn't see what was going on right there. Luckily it turned out well. And to remove that waste I'm going to use a uh, number seven four millimeter gouge. It's got just about the proper curvature to work on everything and I don't know that I can do this on camera because I need to get my head right over it but I'll see what I can do but I just need to go around and kind of nibble at it actually this has not got enough curvature I thought it would so I'm gonna have to go back and get a uh, more steeply curved gouge in this number seven I'll have to look for a number eight now I got a number eight four millimeter gouge and that should more uh, accurately uh, replicate those curves and it does now, I don't care if I undercut it because only the top surface really matters, but I don't want to go past the line. I've gotten the waist out of the way with the gouge, and I'm going to do the first test fitting. And I like to look around and see how it's going to fit on all sides. And if, for, if as is usually the case, it won't quite go in on the first go around, I'm going to look to see if there happens to be any gaps in any of the fits. And there's a bit more of a gap over here than there is on this side but I've got one offending area right here that needs to come out so I'm going to use a scalpel to clean it up and now since this side fits the best of the two I'm going to use it as my reference surface and uh, scribe around it again this time I'm going to use the knife because I've just got just small areas that need work I don't have to go around the whole thing and also I need a little bit more accuracy on this go around and I think it's going to fit on its own down in that bottom yeah it doesn't look like it needs anything and now I can come in with the gouge and take that last little bit actually if I look at that I did not get it all on the first go around because I can still see a little bit of my line from the scriber and blow the waste out of there and what I'm looking for is I want it to start by hand and go about halfway in and that's still not quite enough I need let me look over on this side to make sure now let me put it back in that way see what we got there well, we're very, very close. I won't need much. Just a little bit right in here. Right there. Yep. Yeah. We're talking uh, very small amounts here, but we want to sneak up on it so we don't. And I'm sorry about my hand placement.
and I want to do one last check after I get it where I think it's ready to go in. Yeah, that's what I want. I've got it. It's about halfway in with just finger pressure. So let me get it back out of there. And I've got a depth gauge set, and I just want to make sure that I've got the material all the way out because I don't want it to bottom out. So now this one can be pressed in place. What I'm going to do is get it started with just the hand pressure like I did before and then take the vise and use it kind of like a press to put it in the rest of the way because if I try to drive it in I'll probably drive it in unevenly and it could crush but the vise will set it in there evenly and controlled. And we should have a nice uh, fitting discussion now. And I'll get a close-up of it here in just a second. After pressing it in, I took a block of hardwood and uh, wrapped a, a piece of, I think it was 180, a 180 sandpaper around it and sanded it flush. And I'm satisfied with the fit. Wish it was a little bit better right here. That's where I said I couldn't see. I also have a small gap right there. But they're so insignificant that the shellac and the finish will fill it up. But it would have been better if it weren't there. Now if I had a bigger gap than that, or one that I couldn't live with, there is a, a trick that you can do to save yourself. Pry this discussion back out and put it face up on a smooth metal surface. And then with a smooth faced hammer, peen it in the area, areas that need work. And that will mushroom it a little bit and then you can file it down and press it back in and that can really save your bacon if you make a small mistake. Got the drawer front clamped in the vise and I've already drilled out the 15 64 hole here. You got to be really careful when you do this because the tendency is to want to pull the escutcheon back out. If that happens it's not the end of the world but if it happens too much the escutcheon might not stay in on its own although I think the shellac is going to flow around there and more or less glue it in. But now I've switched over to the 5 seconds bit and I'm going to drill down at the bottom here. And then that leaves a tiny web of wood and I have a small, uh, small almost looks like a, a miniature drywall saw. This is an X-Acto tool here that I can get in there and cut that little bit away, that little web in there. And then we can test fit the lock to see how this turned out. Well one final thing is to check to make sure that the key activates the lock. And I don't want to screw the lock to the drawer until the very end. Those brass screws, the heads are easily stripped or the screw can be broken off so we won't only have to do that once. Uh, with that in mind I just have the lock clamped there in place and I'll put the key in and it goes in against the pin so that's a really good sign and it activates the lock it's a little stiff but I think that's because I got it clamped let me let the pressure off the clamp yeah that helps a lot there now that's what you want but that doesn't always happen so there's a few things that you can do uh, well two things you can do one and this is the simple fix Take a look through the discussion and see where you think the problem might be and then put the key on that post and you can bend that post back and forth a little bit. Not much, but sometimes that's enough to get you out of trouble. Worst case scenario, you're going to have to take and file on the uh, keyhole discussion. Sometimes you can just file a little bevel in there and that'll be enough so that you're not changing the outside shape of it, but uh, that's that's not the best method because that requires your customer to put the key in at just the right angle and they, they may not appreciate that. So you usually have to file a little bit wherever you need to and then even up the perimeter, the inside perimeter of the discussion filing all the way around it. Now I know that some of these steps were kind of painstaking and uh, seemed a little time consuming but that's what it's going to take even if you buy the discussion that's what it's going to take to get a well-fit discussion that lines up with the key or the lock. And uh, it's not something that you can really rush. 
But I hope that through this video that there was something that you found out that will help you in your work. And I want to thank you for watching. Well, I dipped into my supply of uh, scroll saw blades, and I have uh, quite a, an eclectic collection of them. And I found one. Unfortunately, it was not in a package with anything. It actually had the pin ends on it that isn't suitable for this machine. But I beat the pins out of it. And... <laughs>